Hi, welcome back to Curator on the Loose. I am Matthew Burchette. I'm the senior curator at the Museum of Flight in sunny Seattle. What is going on? I don't know, but I love it. And today, not only are we sunny and happy, but we are checking out this old lady. Ever been in the tail position of a B-17 and this is a rare opportunity. Come on, I am so psyched! Oh, sorry. You know you want to do that. I had to do it. All right, we're in the tail position of the B-17. As you can tell, it is pretty cramped in here. What's even more nuts is how I'm sitting. I have a little bicycle seat and my legs are folded under me and my knees and lower legs are literally sitting down on kind of some just padded material. And the poor gunner who was back here had to sit like that for most of the mission. As soon as they were over the channel, you got into position because you never knew when you were gonna get jumped by fighters. It's almost eight hours back here. That is crazy. Now the gunner back here had two 50 caliber machine guns and they were not in a electrically or hydraulically operated turret. Oh no, you were moving those bad boys around by yourself. You'll also see that there's not a lot of armor. There's a small plate in front of my knees and then you've got a pretty thick piece of bulletproof glass right in front of your head. But other than that, it's just plexiglass in thin aluminum sheets. So the flak and fighters were coming at you at really, really breakneck speed, but it was also really drafty. The only thing between you and 30 below, 50 below, was a little piece of canvas where the guns poked out. That does not sound like fun to me. So let's get out of here and move forward into the waist position. The B-17 was very well defended. The G model could carry up to 13 50 caliber machine guns. Ours is an F model, and those could carry anywhere from 11 to maybe even 12, depending upon field modifications. And when I think of the B-17, I think of these two crew members right here, the waste gunners. They had this big open window and a single 50 caliber machine gun, and their job was to defend the sides of the aircraft. It was not a really fun place to be. You had a really nice view, but unfortunately, this hatch to fire the gun had to be open, which means that you were subjected to a 200 mile per hour slipstream at like negative 50 below Fahrenheit because you're flying at 25 to 35,000 feet. That is chilly. Luckily, you had a lot of clothing on to keep you warm. And in fact, an even a heated suit. They called it the blue bunny suit, but it was still cold. And on top of that, you'll see that both guys were literally right in the same area. This is not a small gun. So you're firing like this while your buddy is firing like this and you're bumping each other the entire time. One of the problems was is sometimes you would knock your buddy's oxygen mask off. Well, what happens at 35,000 feet where there's very little oxygen? Hypoxia. So if he didn't get his mask back on pretty dang quick, he could pass out and even die. This was not a great place to be, but it was a very valuable place in the crew system. Now, as the war went on and then the Luftwaffe became less of a problem, they decided, you know what? We don't need two gunners. Let's just go to one. And then very end of the war, they went, you know what? We don't even need one waste gunner. So both of these positions were done away with and the guns were taken away and that lightened the load of the plane. That's not a bad idea, especially when really all you're fighting is flak and you can't shoot back at that. 
one of the things I know you guys are going to ask about is, what's the history of this plane? It's actually pretty amazing. It was built just up the road, literally just up the road at production plant number two here in Seattle, Washington. That's really cool. So in a way, this plane has totally come back home. It was accepted for service in 1943 and spent most of its life here in the United States. In fact, it actually was over in Moses Lake, which is in eastern Washington. And there it was used as a training aircraft. And it blew a tire and then came back over here to Seattle for repairs. After the war, it had a long history, flying cargo, spraying DDT, you name it. But where you probably know it the most from is Hollywood. It was in the Thousand Plane Raid, Tora, 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 and most recently, Memphis Bell. Now, the cool thing about it being in Memphis Bell is there are not a lot of B-17s left flying, and there certainly were even less in the 1970s and 80s. So, to make it seem like there were more planes in that film, they painted one side of this bird in one paint scheme, and then this side in another. So you got two pieces of artwork on one plane. That is really cool. And here's one last little tidbit for you. Did you know that there are only three B-17Fs left? And this is one of them. And it's an amazing bird. So if you get the chance to come here to Seattle, you have to stop and check her out. We're sitting in the radio operator's room and you'll notice there's all sorts of radio equipment. In fact, there's some actually right in front of me too. Huge racks of just nothing but radio tuners and battery boxes and that kind of thing. Now the radio operator had an important job. They monitored all the communications within the aircraft as well as within the squadron and the group and sometimes even the entire bomb wing but they also helped the navigator. How would they do that? Well, they could take radio fixes from across Europe and be able to pinpoint with some degree of accuracy where their aircraft was when they fed that information to the navigator. Pretty important stuff. Now, you'll notice right above me, there's a 50 caliber machine gun. And at first we thought this was really important to have because it was another gun to point towards the rear, but we quickly figured out the Germans were pretty smart and they started attacking our aircraft from the nose. So this position actually became eh, kind of superfluous. And this gun was ditched in the G model after a while and there was no reason for the uh, radio operator to be a gunner. This was one of the areas where guys would come when they were wounded. You could kind of lay people out here or back in the waist position. And the radio operator was usually one of the first people to get to a wounded comrade. So you can tell that the radio guy had a ton of stuff to do and was kept really busy. Now, here's a little secret that a lot of people don't know. I didn't even know this until I was today years old. Check this out. big F camera. This is awesome. This is an F-23 camera. Now you've seen all those photographs of B-17 bombs dropping from out of the plane like you're in the plane looking down. I always thought that was taken from the bomb bay. Uh-uh. Some of these aircraft were equipped with this little compartment and the photographer would sit right here, could open a small set of doors and then take photos of the strike. Those are known as BDA photos, or Bomb Damage Assessment Photos. This is really cool. That means that this plane is even more rare than we expected. How cool is this? You guys are getting the A-list tour today. The heart of any bomber is the bomb bay, and that's where we are right now. The B-17G could carry up to 9,600 pounds of bombs. But that was only for really short missions, say from England to the coast of France and those little towns around there. But for Berlin, you would mostly carry 
4,500 pounds of bombs because you've got so much further to go. And the more weight you carry, the more gas you burn. So we've got this guy mocked up like it would be on a typical Berlin mission with 500 pound general purpose bombs, the M64. And these guys could be set with delayed action fuse or just a fuse that would burst on impact. Now, why would you want a delayed action fuse? Well, it's kind of a kind of a creepy story, but one of the things we would do is mix in delay action bombs with normally fused bombs when we would hit a target. That way, some of the bombs would immediately go off, but others could be set to go off anywhere from 10 to 15 to two or three hours later after they impacted. That's not a fun thing if you're a German firefighter or a worker in a factory because you never knew when something might go off. Yeah. This is kind of an odd shot. I'm standing in the tunnel that leads up to the navigator and bombardier's position, but above me is the Sperry top turret on the B-17, and it was equipped with two 50 caliber machine guns. Now the guy that manned it was also the flight engineer for the aircraft. He was basically the NCO who knew the most about the plane, and so the pilot would pick him to be that gunner because he had an important job. Not only was he taking care of all the aircraft that might be coming at the plane from above, but he was also the guy that knew the most about the plane's systems. If there was a fire, he was the guy to start putting it out. If an engine started to go bad, he was the guy that could maybe help you guys out. It was a really important position. Now one of the things you're probably seeing out the corner of the, the camera viewfinder are these big yellow tanks on either side. Those are oxygen tanks. Like we talked about earlier, when you're flying at 25 to 35,000 feet, there's very little oxygen, certainly not enough to stay on top of everything. So everybody wore an oxygen mask. And you'll see these big yellow cylinders almost all over the plane. The other thing you'll see are little tiny green bottles. They're little apple green bottles, and those were called walk-around bottles. So if you needed to go anywhere and you had to detach yourself from this big hose, you would plug your little walk-around bottle into your oxygen mask, and then you could move about the plane, and you didn't have to be tethered to your station. That's pretty cool. Now, the other thing, and through the magic of B-roll again, we're going to show you, is one of the most important parts about the B-17, the two coffee thermoses. That's right. You've got to have coffee on a big eight-hour trip, and what better place to put them than right down here? B-17, and I gotta tell you, it's an awesome feeling. One of the things that a lot of people don't really realize is that American heavy bombers were kind of a different breed in World War II. We were equipped with a pilot and a co-pilot. Think about the British Lancaster. There was only one pilot for that monstrous bomber. Whereas for the B-17, B-24, and B-29s, you had a co-pilot which was really important, not only to help you with all of these dials and bells and whistles, but also just to keep this guy in formation. These were not an easy plane to fly. They were an awesome plane, but this is a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving airplane. And to keep in formation in what they called a combat box, where your squadron is in a V of three, and there's another V of three below you on left and right, and then expand that into an entire group of three squadrons, and sometimes into a group for a wing, which was three groups, that's up to 54, maybe even 64 planes all flying in pretty close formation. Now, try to do that for eight hours by yourself. It's not going to happen. The co-pilot was there to help relieve you of all that stress. And it also gave them some very valuable stick time for when they got their own plane. That's pretty good thinking right there.
this is where the cool stuff really is. We're in the nose of the B-17, and I'm actually sitting where the bombardier would have sat. And you can tell there's another 50 caliber machine gun to my left and another one to my right. Now, in some F models, there was even a 50 caliber right up here that the bombardier could use. That was a, a pretty typical field modification that actually made its way back to some of the B-17 manufacturers here in the States. What we're looking at here is a very typical modification from Boeing. We quickly found out that the nose of the aircraft was really vulnerable to enemy fighters. So we put in these two 50s and sometimes a 50 up there just to be able to ward off the German fighters. And in the G model, there was even a big turret on the chin with two 50 caliber machine guns that the bombardier had his own little kind of bicycle looking sight that he could use to turn that turret around. But as you all know, the real reason a bombardier was up here was to work that guy the Norden bomb site. If you're not dropping your bombs on target, you're not really a bomber. And the Norden bomb site was the bomb diggity of the day, no pun intended. This thing was a beast. When the B-17 was nearly over its target, it was called the IP, the initial point. And at that time, the bombardier actually turned on his sight and could control the entire aircraft. It was amazing. So he was literally flying this plane with the sight. And the sight could ca calculate the altitude, the wind speed, the direction, and even the bomb arc. And all of that went into this little computer and told the bombardier when to drop the bombs. In fact, in a lot of cases, it would just drop the bombs automatically. As the war got going, we quickly found out we didn't need a bombardier in every plane. So what we would do is we would have a lead bombardier for the squadron, the group, and the wing. And that was a man who really, really knew how to work his equipment. So the rest of the bombardiers quickly became replaced with what were kind of jokingly referred to as toggleers. All they had to do was watch the plane at the front of the group, and as soon as the bombs came out of the bomb bay, he just flipped a switch and dropped his bombs. All we need is one guy to be accurate, and that was the lead bombardier. Now, in front of me, which is actually toward the rear of the plane, is where the navigator sat and the navigator had the most important job of getting from point A to point B. Without a navigator, how do you know where you're going? These guys also could fire these machine guns if need be, but their main job was just to make sure that their plane went from point A to point B correctly. Now, if you're the lead navigator for your group or your squadron or your wing, you have a huge job because you have to get all of the planes to the target and back. Whereas individual navigators would usually keep track of where their individual plane was. Because a lot of times, if you got hit by flak or fighters, you had to drop out of formation. If you don't know where you are, you can't get home again. So the navigator was always keeping track of where they were. And they could do that through a number of ways. Like we mentioned before, they could get a radio fix, and that will give them a general idea of where they could be. They could also look out a window and use what was known as pilotage. That's basically just looking at the ground and comparing it to a map and going, oh yeah, I know where we are. Or you could even take a star or a sun fix through that. That's an astrodome. And it's just a little dome above my head that's clear plexiglass, and you would use a sextant to take a sun or a star reading. Most of the times you wouldn't do that in combat. That was only when you were coming from the United States to get to Europe or Italy, when you had a really long flight. You could also use what's known as dead reckoning. And if you've got a stopwatch, you're good to go. You pretty much know your airspeed, you've got a stopwatch, you can figure out, I should be about here at this time. That's what the navigator did important job. All right, this has been 
an amazing, amazing tour. I have been psyched to be in here. I am seeing things that I've only seen in pictures. This is awesome. And we just want to say thank you so much for coming along with us. I hope you had a great time. If you've got questions or comments, hook us up or look us up on YouTube or Facebook or even, you know what, send us an email at curator at museumofflight.org. We'd be happy to answer questions for you. Please keep tuning in. And again, like we always say, thank you so much for all the donations that you guys have been sending our way. It doesn't matter if it's a million dollars or two dollars. Anything helps. It helps us continue these awesome videos. And let's just be honest, I'm having a blast doing them. So keep that money rolling in. And if you want all sorts of great books on the B-17, check out our store. You spend 50 bucks, we'll ship it to you for free. All right, stay tuned because you never know what we're going to do next.